I'd like to welcome Lise Betteridge, the college's registrar and CEO, to the podium to give her report now. I usually like to make a little joke about adjusting the microphone to, you know, put everybody at ease before I be begin my remarks. So welcome to the 2018 Annual Meeting and Education Day. As always, we are very happy to have you all here today. The theme of this year's event is breaking down barriers. In choosing this theme, we wanted to focus on the concepts of opening the lines of communication, moving forward, and collaborating in order to break down different kinds of barriers. As it turns out, the theme also perfectly describes the college's past year, in which we achieved many milestones and accomplished a great deal in order to help further our important mandate of public protection through the regulation of the social work and social service work professions. Breaking down barriers is also an apt description of the work conducted by social workers and social service workers in their daily practice. With this theme in mind, we're very pleased to have Cassandra D Diamond as our keynote speaker this morning. In her keynote address, Cassandra will draw on previous lived experience and her current role as director of the charitable organization Bridge North to discuss indicators of human trafficking as they relate to children and youth. Cassandra will share how having a better understanding of the unique subculture of the sex trade will assist social workers and social service workers in recognizing human trafficking situations and allow them to be more effective in their practice. We're so pleased to have Cassandra present on this important subject today. In the afternoon breakout sessions, we will explore how social workers and social service workers can work towards facilitating positive change at both individual and systemic levels. These educational sessions will look at how we can provide high quality, compassionate care for individuals and families of all ages. How we can support clients before, during and after transition related surgeries. And how we can address barriers to help children at risk. This is just a small sample of the range of relevant issues covered in what we know will be a highly informative, informative breakout sessions. You will have each chosen two breakout sessions to attend today. However, you'll have the opportunity to review other sessions of interest as most of our presenters' PowerPoint presentations will be made available on the college website following the event. Now that I've given you some of the highlights that will follow a bit later in the day, it's time to move on to some important business. As Registrar of the College, it's my responsibility this morning to provide a snapshot of the College's 2017 operational activities. The operations of the College are guided by our legislative mandate, as well as policy directions approved by Council. The accomplishments that I will report on today are the result of the hard work of all College staff guided by a very capable management team. I'd like to begin by commenting on the college's finances, as reported in the annual report and by our auditor, Talia Rubin of Gross Oberman. As you can see, the college's finances are well managed and its financial position continues to be stable. As has been explained in previous years, in 2009, the council made a strategic decision to approve ongoing deficit budgets in order to draw down in a planned and gradual way on the reserve fund built up in the early years of operations. The reserve must be sufficient to ensure that the college can fulfill its obligations as a regulatory body and remain viable in the long term, yet not excessive for those purposes. We're continually aware of the need to be prudent as we intentionally draw down on the reserve fund. As the reserve is drawing nearer to the target established by Council, so too are we moving closer to a balanced budget. This careful planning means that we are well prepared for any potential risks that the College may face. Every year, in addition to its annual budgeting process, the College carefully considers cash flow projections. These assist Council in making important budgetary decisions. Both processes are critical in ensuring that there is adequate funding to meet our ongoing obligations, fund current projects, and implement new programs, all in the service of our mandate. It should be emphasized that all decisions are made through the lens of our mandate to govern the professions of social work and social service work and serve and protect the public interest. 
In this year's financial statements, you may have noticed a significant increase in legal costs from $584,000 in 2016 to just over $1.2 million in 2017. Although it might appear that the legal costs doubled in 2017, this is not the case. This change reflects a newly implemented auditing requirement for regulatory bodies to accrue or include legal costs associated with hearings that are in progress at the end of the year and expected to be carried over into the next year when they can be reasonably estimated. Now that the college has had its first protracted discipline hearing, we're in a position for the first time to reasonably estimate these costs. And this is why you see them in the statements. The jump that you see is a one-time occurrence and reflects the fact that this is the first time we've been required to do this. I do want to stress that it isn't a unique situation for the college, and it's one to which other regulatory colleges are also having to adjust. Aside from this issue, I also want to share with you that like other regulators, including social work regulators across Canada and internationally, we're noticing an increase in the seriousness and complexity of complaints and discipline matters generally. There is no doubt that legal services are essential in order for the college to carry out its core mandate of protecting the public from unqualified, incompetent and unfit practitioners by ensuring rigorous complaints and discipline processes are in place and in the process, minimizing risk and achieving regulatory effectiveness. I want to reassure you that the college remains committed to the prudent use of these legal resources. The other budget line where you may have noticed an increase was the website, where costs increased from just over $1,000 in 2016 to $33,445 in 2017. The college is very proud of its continuous improvement in the area of stakeholder and public awareness. The increased costs in this line are associated with necessary updates to the website, including the migration to a new platform to ensure usability and efficiency, as well as maintenance costs, which ensure that this extremely important communications and public awareness tool remains up to date and user friendly. You'll note from the annual report that 2,031 new members registered in 2017. Once again, we were pleased with the number of new graduate members. Overall, 1,034 new graduates registered in 2017. 95% of members renewed their membership with the college in 2017, increasing the total number of college members to 20,008 as of December 31st, 2017. As is the case every year, in 2017, the college submitted its annual reports on its registration practices to the Office of the Fairness Commissioner in accordance with the Fair Access to the Regulated Professions Act. In this area and others, the college is committed to continually improving its processes to ensure transparency and fairness. The OFC reports can be found on the college website. The past year was very productive and rewarding for the college as we achieved many milestones. Last December, for example, the college increased its membership to over 20,000 members. This is a significant moment in the college's 18-year history and one that elevates its profile within the regulatory community. In 2017, we were very pleased to learn that the government had approved proposed amendments to the registration regulation made under the Social Work and Social Service Work Act, which include, among, among other changes, the creation of a new retired class of certificate of registration. As Shelley noted in her address, the college achieved another major and long-awaited milestone when the government of Ontario proclaimed the Controlled Act of Psychotherapy, the college's first controlled act. The college recently communicated to members and stakeholders that the new Child, Youth and Family Services Act, the CYFSA, and its supporting regulations were proclaimed in force as of April 30th. The CYFSA replaced the Child and Family Services Act. We've worked with government to address our concerns about regulations under the new CYFSA, which set out the qualifications of Children's Aid Society, or CAS, staff. Upon learning in late November that the proposed regulations would continue to allow CAS workers to avoid registration with the college, we immediately engaged with the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, MCYS, and outlined our strong concerns. The college's e-bulletin, which is available on our website, provides an overview of the key issues. We were pleased to see that the new regulation was updated to require local directors of CASs to be registered with the college. 
While the new regulation does not currently require CAS supervisors to be registered, we have received a commitment from the government to work with the college and the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies toward a goal of requiring registration of CAS supervisors beginning January 2016. We continue to engage proactively with the Ministry of Children and Youth Services around the issue of registration of CAS staff, something which highlights the importance of the college being at the table when the government proposes regulations that affect the college's ability to carry out its important public protection mandate. The college continues to make great progress toward achieving the four strategic objectives outlined in the 2016 to 19 strategic plan. They include strengthening stakeholder and public awareness, upholding ethical and professional practice, maintaining effective governance, and achieving regulatory effectiveness. The college's first strategic priority is to strengthen stakeholder and public awareness. The past year was very productive for the college on this front as we continued to engage stakeholders across Ontario and further enhance public awareness about the college and its role. Last fall, for example, the college launched its inaugural employer outreach campaign. This multifaceted campaign featured an interactive quiz and online advertising that informed employers about the benefits of hiring registered social workers and registered social service workers and increased awareness with respect to the college's online register, an important tool for employers. As part of the campaign, the college also rolled out a new quarterly publication for employers called the Employer Communique. Enhancing our digital presence continues to play a major role in the college's efforts to strengthen stakeholder and public awareness. Over the past year, we've worked to improve usability on the college website and member database to better serve members and the public. Two of our newsletters, Perspective and the Employer Communique, are now in website-friendly format. And last summer, we created a Facebook page which allows us to reach a wider audience and connect with members and the public in a new way. In the days ahead, we'll continue looking for new ways to reach our stakeholders and better inform and engage members, employers, students, and educators. The college's second strategic objective is upholding professional and ethical practice. In 2017, we updated and published professional resources to assist members in their practice. We revised the standards of practice, developed two practice notes, and published the practice guidelines for performing the controlled active psychotherapy. More recently, in 2018, we uploaded a new continuing competence program, CCP video, which assists members in completing their annual CCP requirements. If you haven't seen the CCP video, I encourage you to visit, view it on our website or YouTube channel. For the college, upholding professional and ethical practice also involves connecting face-to-face -face with members and other stakeholders. In 2017, the college's professional practice department delivered 53 presentations across the province in all five of our electoral districts. To give some perspective, this is more than double the number of professional practice presentations delivered in 2016. In addition, the college's professional practice department staffed a booth at six career fairs and participated on three panels. To enhance awareness among students and educators, the college developed informational packages for academic institutions, which included postcards, posters, and other resources and materials. Last year was once again a busy year for our professional practice department, which experienced an increase in practice consultations as well. The college provided over 3,000 practice consultations to members and the general public, which represents a significant 16% increase over 2016. The most common inquiries in 2017 were related to scope of practice, consent, confidentiality, and duty to warn, and the college's continuing competence program. The college maintains effective governance by promoting a culture of diversity, inquiry, and accessibility by ensuring college resources comply with accessibility standards. Last year, college, the college held council elections in electoral district number three and welcomed new council members Charlene Cruz, RSSW, Tula Kurjantakis, RSW, and Venita Puri, RSW, as well as council member Judy Gardner, RSSW, who was re-elected. Achieving regulatory effectiveness is the college's fourth strategic priority. 
In 2017, the college updated its database to improve the member experience and expand service delivery. This was an extremely large but essential project made possible as, the res as a result of the hard work of our dedicated staff. One of the ways the college achieves regulatory effectiveness is through ensuring timely and effective complaints and discipline processes. In 2017, the college opened 49 complaints investigations and closed 64 complaints investigations. The complaints committee released 62 written decisions and reasons. The college's executive committee received and considered 18 reports in 2017. Nine decisions and reasons were issued last year. Regulatory investigations were conducted, resulting in 11 referrals to the discipline committee. The fitness to practice committee held one hearing and issued one decision in 2017. Last year, the discipline committee completed four pre-hearing conferences and held eight hearings. The annual report contains further information regarding the issues raised by these complaints, as well as statistics regarding the disposition of these matters. As you know, the Discipline Committee decision summaries are published in the Perspective newsletter and made available on the College website in both English and French. We charted new ground and built many bridges in 2017. We're proud of our success and look forward to the regulatory challenges which lie ahead. I wish to take this opportunity to thank Council President Shelley Hale and members of Council and Committees for their ongoing leadership. You've created the vision which permits the College to take on new endeavours and you continue to offer the support so that we are able to achieve them. Last, but by no means least, I wish to acknowledge and thank our dedicated College staff. I'm very proud to work alongside you. Together, we will continue to be committed to excellence in our important duty to protect the public interest. Before we proceed with our day, I'd like to remind you to join us on Twitter by using the hashtag Ahmed2018. Thank you.